first book was called Mountains of Mind, was about what Joe Simpson calls inverted gravity, which is his great phrase with a counterintuitive force that pulls people upwards to mountain summits uh, at risk of their limbs and sometimes at cost of their lives. And the second book was called Wild Places and was a, an investigation or exploration into why we might need wildness. There's a lovely line from Wallace Stegner's famous wilderness letter, 1962, I think it is, when he says, we need wilderness available to us, even if we do nothing other than drive to its edge and look in. And this is what he calls the notion of the geography of hope, which is a brilliant and resonant phrase that certain landscapes, certain places might do us good in ways that are unmistakable to experience, but very difficult to articulate. I kept thinking I was leaving these ideas, but they keep coming back to me. And so five years on from beginning the wild places, I found myself beginning the old ways. They are fugitive questions, these are notions of how we are shaped by our landscapes, how we think not just on them or not just about them, but in some sense with them. And it's probably time that I stopped all the preamble and told you some of the walks I took and the stories that came of them because the relationship between walking and writing between paths and stories they keep and tell is at the heart of the book. So one of the first walks I took, in fact really the very first walk I took, was along the Ickneald Way, where far west, but if you head further east, some of you will know the Ickneald Way, runs from somewhere in the Norfolk heathlands down southeast of Cambridge, and then somewhere it frays into the Ridgeway, and where the Ickneald Way gives way to the Ridgeway is a matter of speculation as indeed is the proper age, the extent, the origins of the Ickneald Way. For a long time it was badged as the oldest way in England and for that reason it has drawn dreamers and antiquarians to it for hundreds of years. Edward Thomas walked it 99 years ago, uh, no no sorry 101 years ago, he walked it 99 years ago I think when I set out to walk it. It runs close to my home in Cambridge. I was able to set out on a bright May morning while my family was still asleep, feeling very kind of boyish and famous five-ish with a knapsack, technically a rucksack, um, filled with ginger beer, technically water. Um, and uh, I followed a field path, a beautiful field path, which is really a new way away from my home. It intersects with a Roman road, which I picked up. I followed the Roman road. The Roman road meets at the perpendicular, the Ickneald Way. And there I set out and on beautiful, bright, endless, apparently, days of walking. And if we go to the first slide, oh, sorry, the next slide. This is the South Downs, incidentally. That's the Indian Way. Um, uh, arguably 5,000 years old, and here it crosses the M11, which was opened in 1972. Um, and my, I guess, initial dreams of time travel though they were fulfilled in many, many ways, were not always fulfilled. And that's because the old ways are interlocked with, are overrun by, and fascinatingly weave with the very new ways. And this is one of those juxtapositions. Your eye, when you follow paths over a long period of time, some people know, starts to see in lines. And you realize that paths are expressed in many different ways in the landscape. They are, some of them are debos, as it were. Others exist as phenomena of um, light and other unusual forms. Uh, this is just a phone snap I took as I was walking the Ignil Way, beautiful buttercup meadow. It looks like a Richard Long, some of you will know 1967, a line made by walking, and uh, Richard Long very kindly gave permission for one of his beautiful path images to be used on the cover of the book. Uh, that a line made by walking was his own inscription on a line just like this in a flower meadow, not so far from here as I recall. But, these happenstance artifacts I found littered along the way, and strange convergences of artwork and path were everywhere. And this was one of the most strange, lustrous expressions of the path that I came across. But there's some sense that Frost knew about connected power of paths, and I now know that too. You all will know it to some degree. And the path that I followed took me in all sorts of directions and inaugurated all sorts of meetings, and one of the places they took me was offshore, and I'll say a little about sea paths in a second, but before then, I'll just go to something called the Broom Way, which is a sort of interstitial midway path. Um, 
those of you who've, who've read the book will, may remember this chapter. The Broomway is a, is, a, is a tidal path that runs from the Essex mainland at Wakering Stairs offshore for directly perpendicular to shoreline for about half three quarters of a mile, then due northeast for three miles or so before curling back to make landfall at, 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 on, on Falmouth Island, which is owned by the MOD. Magnificently, though the MOD do, as it were, all they can to dissuade you from walking it, and the, the tide, uh, which comes in very fast and lethally there, does a very good job of dissuading you from walking it. It is nonetheless a public right of way, and its continued existence is a vindication of the respect that is given to legally to the right of way in English law. And it is quite an alarming and counterintuitive path to walk, not least because it has an Edwardian Gothic atmosphere. Um, I say Edwardian, anyway. Uh, because 66 of the people it's killed are in the Fowlness churchyard and the bodies of the rest of them haven't been uh, uh, recovered. But these are people who died before handheld compasses and before GPS. The problem is that you walk straight out to sea, you get your tide times right, you make sure the LED aren't firing, um, and then you're faced with this, which is the causeway that leads you out over what's called the black grounds, which are the months that you really don't want to get your feet stuck in. And just before I set off, an Alaskan friend of mine who, it's called James Wayne, lives in the Alaskan uh, Hall of Fame for Wrestling, along with his three brothers, um, Jed, Jake, and Jack. Uh, it's true. Um, the, the only four brothers to be in any, Alaska, in any state Hall of Fame for sport currently living. They're an amazing family. You don't want to mess with them at all. Um, he says, you know, if you're going to do this war, that's fine, but what you should do, in case you get stuck, you should take a little hatchet with you, and in that way you can cut your legs off at the ankles <laughs> and get yourself to safety. You walk out along these causeways, they, they take you out onto the greenway, which is hard sand. And it's hard enough you can drive vehicles on it. That's how they evacuated people from Falness in 1953 when the great storm surge came. It was so disastrous up and down the North Sea coasts of Europe and England. Um, but it is nonetheless uh, uh, an odd experience. You walk out and wait for the water to retreat, and then you reach the end of the causeway and step onto the hard sanding. And you're always walking on an inch or three inches of water. So you find yourself in this extraordinary mirror world. Uh, and I did uh, meet so many people for whom landscape, and in particular the walking of it, was uh, vital to their well-being and to their senses of themselves. And in this sense, I came to think of walking in particular as a, as a cutting-edge technology, that it's our, our oldest means of mobility, but it's also a continually refreshing means of finding our way within the world uh, in all the, many of the senses of that very open phrase. I met so many kinds of people. I met pilgrims and I met tramps and I met saunterers and I met artists and cartographers and archaeologists and poets and sailors and lots of ordinary folk who were just walking short distances or long for this reason or that and I loved talking to them all. This is, I walked down all the way from west, northwest Lewis down into southeast Harris through the great open spaces of the Lewis and Harris deer forests with eagles by the dozen, I'd be very blasé about eagles. I, you know, I spasm if I see a sparrow hawk in my garden, but by the end of that walk, I saw a dozen eagles in the sky. Um, it, and, and I ended up being welcomed in off the road by um, a man that probably I shouldn't have um, stepped over the doorstep of, a wonderful sculptor called Steve Dillard. Um, and as your eyes begin to loiter and investigate the workshop here, which is his tiny workshop on this little village called uh, Eocrab in, in South East Harris. You, you, you yourselves might wonder that I'm here tonight. Um, <laughs> he has, he has um, chest freezers. I just always think that's, I've decided that. <laughs> <laughs> Never stay the night with the person who has a chest freezer. That's, <laughs> that's the moral I learned. When people say, what did you learn on your journey? So, so. Um, yeah, the, the, the figure hanging noosed and trussed in the background was not some earlier walker, but is one of his great enduring pieces called The Hanging Figure, um, which he made in the 70s, and is, consists of a human skeleton reclothed in calf flesh and then trussed in seagrass. And when I was with him, he was going to put it in this boulder. He was going to slice the top of this boulder in this weird sacred landscape of the Harris interior that he sacralized by walking. He was going to hang the, the body 
in, in you can core attack like an apple, hang your body inside it, dispose of the core, relive the boulder, let lichen and weather seal it back up and it would become a, a kind of unknown grave or kiss, a, a Scots word for a chamber in which the, the body could, could hang. Um, but I, when I spoke to him recently, he said he'd sold it to a collector in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so it was down, steeply down across shale slopes, the stones of the path flowing in the sunlight, horses skidding on their front hooves, breaking with their back hooves, deerskin bags lurching forwards on their flanks, their bells tolling rapid alarm. We came on behind, tracing a stream cut as it plunged from the pass, following it between saplings of pine and oak and through bushes of rhododendron, stumbling in powder snow that reached knee deep in places. The stream was part frozen, halted mid leap in elaborate forms of yearning, chandeliers and ink flakes and hat feathers. And on the west side of the valley, the tops of distant oaks shone like brass in the sunlight. A small bright fur flew to a gnarled pine. We rested in a clearing to shepherd's hut. I sat with my back against the warm wall, facing the sun and the mountain, narrowing my eyes. Um, and that point of rest seems like a good uh, point to rest, so thank you very much for listening.